Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be this morning. Uh, if, if it's a little chilly in here, we are sorry about that. The, uh, we're getting the, the, somehow the furnace malfunctioned and we're going to hopefully get that fixed before uh, next week, but we'll kind of work through it. So just, uh, I think sometimes I hear that the Baptists are the frozen chosen. We might actually get to do that this week. So. Matthew chapter 5, uh, sorry, Matthew <laughs> chapter 6, we're going to pick up in verse uh, 25 and uh, the scripture the scripture says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What will you eat or what you will drink? Nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into heaven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows all you need, that, that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about his own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can study this word and just, uh, Lord, just allow the truth of the word uh, to be proclaimed this morning. Say my prayer. Amen. So we, we take a look uh, at this particular uh, scripture, and in verse 25, we start off with uh, the word, uh, therefore, and this is why several years ago I transitioned, uh, I, I believe I've, about 90-95% of the time have always been an expository uh, pastor, an expository uh, preacher where we open up the scripture, we're going to go verse by verse or, or section by section and just see what God has in store for it. We're going to pull out uh, the word, what, what God has for us. Uh, and and I, I'd always done that, but uh, a few years ago I started doing whole books at a time, or at least large sections at a time, because you get these transitions like, therefore, and we really need to, to have it in context what we're talking about. So if you remember, we started this particular series in Matthew chapter 5, and it's the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount, I think I might have incorrectly said to you uh, that we'll, we will pause the Sermon on the Mount after uh, this week and kind of go into our, our uh, Christmas season, our Advent season. But the Sermon on the Mount will continue uh, through chapter 7. It doesn't stop it. That is a stop there. It actually goes on one more chapter. But, uh, but as, we, as we've been studying this Sermon on the Mount, remember that this is Jesus talking to uh, the, the really the Jews of the time. He is, he is really kind of going toe-to-toe -to -toe saying, look what the Pharisees are doing, and this is what we need to be doing. This is what the Pharisees, how they pray, and this is what the God, uh, the Heavenly Father needs out of your prayer life. This is what the Pharisees do with their food. This is their fasting. This is what God wants of your fasting. This is what the Pharisees do with their money. This is what God wants of your money. He keeps kind of pushing back and forth on this, and it's it's easy for us to sit back and say, well, that's, that's convenient. I'm not a Pharisee or, or whatever. I'm not a religious leader uh, of Jesus' time, but we do need to be very careful that we, in our, uh, in our own minds, in our own ways, uh, don't start adopting those things and start having this idea of like, well, this is how you do church because this is how it's always been done. We have to be very careful of that, and that's what Jesus keeps uh, pushing it. He keeps looking at it going, listen, uh, we have to pay attention to uh, God's plan in all this. And, and he gets just gets done with, when we see that word therefore, in verse 24, he just gets done with this sentence where he's talking about what to do with, with money. And he's talking about uh, storing up treasures in heaven and that when we do these these good deeds, when we, when we, when we are honorable to the Father, we're faithful in our service, that we are, in some capacity, storing up these treasures in heaven. And again, don't ask me really any more about it than that, because I am utterly confused by how this transaction works. I just know that that's what the scripture says. 
But what he finishes up in verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters. He goes, and, and at that point, he's specifically talking about money. He says, you're going to love God or you're going to love your money. You can't serve two masters. And he transitions out of there and says, don't worry about your life. And I think for some of us, for many of us, that that worry, that is a, that, that is a master to some of us. Anxiety can become a master to us. That we start to bow before our anxiety. We start to bow before our worry. We start to be so consumed with what's going on in our life that we, that we let it cripple us, that we let Satan use that and cripple us to where we become ineffective in glorifying God. I think that's what we, as we take a look at this transition in the, in the, in the 25 where it says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body. Uh, or what you're aware is life not more than food uh, in the body more than clothing. This is this is uh, God again. Or sorry, just working through this. He's, he's trying us to remember that man, our true home is in heaven. That's why we're storing the treasure up there. That's our, that's our true home. And the problem with our with our true home being in heaven, at least on this side, is we're fearful. As your pastor, I am. Fearful, routinely. So Jesus tells us that we don't have to worry about these carnal things. And he immediately goes into food and clothes. It's interesting that, that we go into that. How many times have, have uh, I heard the phrase, uh, I don't, I don't um, eat so I can live, I live so I can eat. You guys hear that, that phrase? Uh, occasionally, I know my, my brother, uh, and, and uh, again, uh, very good uh, individual, but uh, we'll just be done with the large dinner at my mom's house. And I'm like, we, we are like just done. The food hasn't been clear from the table. And he'll lean back and go, so what are we going to have for dinner? You know, like, what's the next meal? And, and all of us are going, we can't even think about that. He goes, this is the best time to think about your next meal because you're not hungry yet. You can make a good decision. Like, he's got this whole thing planned out. He's a, a very well, uh, well-versed well theology in, the, in, in how one plans meals. Um, but obviously, it's more than just the food. Right? It's more than that. He goes, it's more than the food that you eat and the clothes that you wear. Uh, I, I, I hope that I've gotten to a point in my life where, where the clothes that I wear aren't all that important. But man, I can certainly remember a time when that was not the case. When I was a young boy, I attended uh, St. Andrews, the, the, the you know, Catholic school there in Tipton. And, and the, the good thing about St. Andrews is we had to wear uniforms, so I never had to worry about that. I was on the back end, uh, I'm the second to the youngest of nine children my mom and dad raised. I didn't know what a new tag looked like. Like, I had no concept what a new pair of jeans felt like. I had no concept what clothes were that weren't, like, you can look at, my mom's got all these photo albums. Imagine that, my mom and photo albums. You guys probably didn't know that happened, but uh, my, my wife will pull up photo albums, and she loves it. She thinks it's the funniest thing ever, because she'll look at pictures of, say, my brothers in 1988, and then me in 1992, and we look the same, because we have the same clothes on. Like, we, we really... So when I, went to, when I went to school, we didn't have to worry about that. We had... Uniforms. The only part of individuality you could express in a uniform is your tennis shoes. And being a young child, a, a young boy in the early 90s, there was one particular brand of tennis shoe that if you had, you were it. The Nike Air Jordan series. I don't know if you guys remember the old Air Jordans. They might still make Air Jordans, I'm not sure. But, uh, but uh, man, if you could get the Nike Air Jordans, you were, that was it. I never had that. I never. <laughs> I wanted so badly to, to be like the other kids that I would take my whatever off brand shoe and I would draw the little Nike signs on it. <laughs> right? Draw the little air, you know, the air, what they call it. They, they, they had a name for it the jump man, right? The, the, air, the air Jordan symbol. I draw them on there. Of course, it looked like a third grader drew on a shoe. But, um, <laughs> man, I remember being mad, mad at my parents. Come on, Mom, can you just, all the other kids have the good shoes. All the other kids get Michael Jordan shoes. All the other kids, you know, like, I remember having, the, like, very spirited conversations.
conversations with my mom about it. In fact, such that I sometimes watch my son arguing with his mom and I hear myself from 30 years ago or 20 years ago uh, coming out. And, 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 and you know what? For the most part, I think I'm a fairly well-adjusted adult. For the most part, I think I made it through without Air Jordans. You know, I wonder how many times in my life, and I know that may be kind of an odd story to talk about, but I wonder how many times in my life I look at something that I'm dealing with. Because remember, I'm a child of God. Just like I was a child for my parents, and my parents were raising me, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of the Almighty Creator of the universe. And I wonder how many times I have these problems, these worries, my anxiety that I get mad at God. And I say, come on, God, why can't you give, give me this blessing? Give me whatever. Don't you understand, God, how important this is in my life? And, and, and God, in his infinite wisdom, is sitting there going, you'll be all right. Give it time. You'll understand one day. It's kind of funny. If you see the way my children dress uh, they're way, way, way better than I ever got uh, because I married a lady who uh, really enjoys the garage sales. She, she does really well uh, on some of that. And some of, some of, even some people in this room will notice some of the clothes that they wear as some that your children used, you know, used to wear. But um, so much more than just clothing. How much? How much do we spend? How much energy do we spend on clothing? How much energy? I'm pretty certain. Now, I, I should start taking pictures, but then I'll probably get in more trouble if I do that. But I'm pretty certain that what my wife is wearing right now is not what I saw her wearing earlier this morning. I think she tries on clothes, and, and I, like she looks like she's ready to leave, and then we're not ready to leave, and, and she pops out of the bathroom, and she's wearing something different. And I don't understand exactly what happens there, but apparently there's, a, there's an ordeal that goes on. Uh, I'm not not judging. I'm not judging. It's all good. Yes, you are. <laughs> I just don't want to be late. I'm pleased okay. to work with anyway. How much energy do we spend on that? And I really think what God is looking at us is, is, is that as, as we get older, we kind of see kind of more of this stuff, these things that we thought were important at one time. How much of that is, is God saying, like, listen, I've got this. I can control this. And he goes on and he goes to this birds of the air. He goes, look at, consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather the barns, yet the heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Do you realize that we as humans, as the chosen uh, 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 of God the Father, uh, and uh, part of the elect, we are worth more than birds? Do you realize that? At some point in time, uh, if I ever decide I'm going to uh, look for a new job and I put on my resume, one of the, one of the qualify, uh, qualifications I'm going to put on my resume, I'm going to say I'm a graduate of college, I'm a, I've, I've been doing uh, project management or whatever for the last 15 years, I can put all that stuff, and right in the middle of that, I'm going to put worth more than birds. Because <laughs> I want them to ask me, and I can say, well, I'm glad you asked that, and we're going to talk about why I'm worth more than birds. I just wonder what kind of question that's going to come about. You see, unfortunately, in our culture today, I wonder if we understand that we're worth more than birds. I won't dwell on this topic too much, but you realize that sea turtles are more protected in our culture today than, than unborn children. Go, go to a beach somewhere where the sea turtle laid their eggs and dig, and dig them up. We're talking jail time. I'm sure glad those unborn sea turtles have such protection. Guys, as humans, we are worth more than that. Does that mean that we get to throw around and, and tear up this great country that we live in, this great land, this world, this earth that God created? Absolutely not. Remember what Adam was, was charged with was, was, was to be a protector of that. We, as, as, a, as, a, as a human race, as God's, uh, as God's uh, people, we do need to be responsible for taking care of it. We should take care of it. But you are worth more than the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and all that kind of stuff. You are worth more than that because what, what, is, what does the scripture say? It says that God just created all that. He spoke it into existence. But when he got to the human, he formed Adam out of dust and he breathed life. That's how much he cares for you. So it's not you worth more than that. It says, observe how the wildflowers grow in the field. They don't labor or spin or tread. They're just beautiful. 
They grow. No one sows those seeds. It's all God's handiwork. This earlier this year, uh, Kay and I got to, to go off to uh, uh, off to Colorado, and it was pretty neat. And then one of the one of the spots that we went onto, we were on this like uh, I don't know, we just driving around really. And uh, this, there's this huge valley, beautiful mountains, and the whole valley is just is nothing but an explosion of color that was uh, primarily yellow, but it was it was wildflowers. It was, it was beautiful. No one went out there and planted that, right? That's just God saying, here, here's some handiwork. This is what I do on my off time, right? This is, this is just me being me. So you're worth more than that. You are worth more than that. He goes on to say, has anyone gotten one cubit taller by worrying? Can anyone get taller by worrying a cubit, by the way, 18 inches? Man, if I could have gotten taller by worrying, I would be uh, pretty pretty tall by now. It doesn't work. In fact, what, what, we, what we have learned in, our, in modern science today, what we have learned is that the more you worry, bad things actually, like, physically can happen to you. Worry is directly related to uh, high blood pressure. Worry can actually make, uh, I guess, your hair turn gray or whatever. But, but uh, hurry has adverse effects. It can, it can affect your diet. It can affect your metabolism. It can affect an awful lot of things about you. One of the first things that happened to me when I started having uh, some of those heart issues is that they, the, the doctor was talking to me. He said, how stressed are you? And I said, I don't, I don't feel like I'm all that stressed. And I got four children. And he goes, oh, you're, you're plenty stressed. Like, uh, but but one of the first things they ask you is, are you stressed? Because apparently stress and worry and anxiety can, can start having heart problems. It can start having uh, panic attacks that actually look a lot like and, and they have a lot of the same symptoms of a heart attack. That's what worry does for you. And so God's just saying, hey, don't worry. Man, I, you know what? I was so excited to, I knew this sermon was coming up. I was so excited to be researching about this. And I've been, I've been, I've been doing, obviously, a lot of that research. And, and as, as this week got closer and closer, I've gotten more and more disappointed. Because I was hoping that, that, that through my research, through God's uh, revelation to me, that, that, that I could just be like, I have found the cure. I don't worry anymore. I wish I could, I wish I could stand here and pat the pulpit and say, I no longer have any worry. You know what I learned? I'm just not listening to what God told me. Well, darn, I already knew that. I already knew that I wasn't very obedient. Jesus himself says, don't worry. He says, tomorrow will bring about its own problems. Man, I am so worried about tomorrow. I'm worried about 10 years. I'm worried about 20 years. I'm worried about all kinds of things. I'm worried about things that I'm pretty sure won't happen. I'm worried about things that even if they did happen, I can't fix them. That's the kind of worry that I have. And the problem with my life, and, and, and maybe you can identify with this, but worry to me, it's a real deal. When I become anxious and, 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 uh, and worried, it manifests itself to, in two ways in my life. I get angry, I get a little snippy, it's because I can't, and, 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 I, and, I, and I want to control. Two things that the way I react to anger is I'm going to start controlling the situation, and I get mad. That's interesting. Because in the scripture, what we learn is that it says that we shouldn't be quick to anger. We should actually be slow to speak and slow to listen. It says, for man's anger doesn't bring out the righteousness that God desires. And you know what the other thing that God constantly tells us? He says, you're never going to have control. He says, I've got control. So, the, so when I get anxious, when I get nervous, when I get stressed, the two things that I react with are the two things, or at least two of the things, that Jesus explicitly, through the words of the scripture, says you can't do. So again, I read this. I'm not supposed to worry. And then he, and Jesus says in verse 30, Oh, you of little faith. You know how much faith it takes to really look at that and say, man, I'm, I don't, I'm not concerned. And what about real worry, man? Real anxiousness. Real things that can cause depression. Man, the last 12 to 18 months, as a, as, a, as a people, as a country, we've been under tremendous stress. Tremendous stress. This whole pandemic. Remember when, it, uh, man, was it two years ago? Back in January of two years ago, maybe February two years ago, 
I was reading reports about this, this, uh, this disease in this far off land called Seattle, right? People getting sick, and it's like, that's weird. And then it was like, within overnight, I start getting phone calls and, and things start shutting down. And all of a sudden, we're in lockdown. Even today, products, we don't know what's gonna, we haven't, we haven't, we don't know how bad the HVAC here is. It may need to be replaced. It may have to be replaced. I don't know, maybe. But if it has to be replaced, this item that, that a year ago or two years ago would have been like maybe a five, seven day lead time, it could be six months. Because that's the way, like, the supply chain's totally messed up. People are completely stressed. The pandemic uh, that brings about all this social unrest, this rioting, all this kind of stuff. Man, people are stressed. People are stressed. We're anxious. We're worried. And what does Jesus say? He says, don't. Like, man, I, 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 believe me, I have been studying this. I've been listening to all sorts of other pastors preaching on this. I mean, I've, I've wanted this golden ticket that said, hey, you go, Andrew, you'll never have to worry again. I'm not getting it. You see, what, what I'm being told is things I already knew. Think about Jesus when, when he went and visited uh, two ladies, Mary and Martha. And while he's there, uh, Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. She is receiving instruction straight from God. And what's Martha doing? She's trying to clean. She's trying to get it set up. She's trying to fix the food or whatever the case is. And Martha is so fed up that Mary's not pulling her weight. She goes over to Jesus and she says, hey, Jesus, tell her to do something. And Jesus looks right at Martha and says, no, she's picked the right thing. Guys, in our life, we have got to figure out the, 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 this, this cure for anxiety. What we have to do, it, and, 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 and the cure is right there in verse 33. It says, seek thee first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. To seek first the kingdom of God, to, to truly to be able to come up to your life and say, you know what, God, this is for your glory. Whatever happens, this is going to be for your glory. See, I knew this was coming up. For several weeks, I've been looking ahead of this. this I, you know, I've got different stages of, of, of sermon preparation, and, 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 uh, and I've, been, I've been knowing this is coming up. This week, this is something that I read um, from, from Stephen Strauss, who, who I, I know I never got to physically work with, but I've gotten to know through, through the ministry and some stuff. This week, he posted, Two years of living. Two years ago today, the Friday before Thanksgiving, I went to a follow-up appointment for one of the scans I had done. I had downplayed the situation, but gave in and allowed my dear friend James to go with me. It was at that appointment that I heard the life-changing words, stage four, lung cancer. I remember upon asking that I was told eight months to two years, and that I would eventually die of cancer. I wept, I grieved, I established from there, okay, let's do this. Well, it's been two years. These past two years have been a true journey. I know it's changed me some ways I don't like. Some ways are so unexpectedly powerful. I never sought out to be an inspiration, but to God be the glory if he has used me. I'm just me. Simple in faith and seeking to live life to the fullest in what I have left. I've experienced all stages of grief in multiple seasons. I've hurt, I've cried, I've laughed about death, I've planned my death. For months at night, I would replay my funeral as a stage director, watching from the black at the theater. I planned everything as a producer, would have planned the most important event ever. Finances are in place, and legal legalities are arranged. I've had nearly 15 rounds of chemotherapy, six hours each in a chair. I've had six sessions of immunotherapy, causing ongoing diabetes. I have had 20 rounds of radiation in two seasons. I've been in a diabetic coma within hours of death. I've had numerous hospital stays and ER visits. I've spent the night on a bathroom floor. In all of it, God be the glory. For since that day of diagnosis two years ago today, I have not had a day of depression nor an episode of anxiety. Some have protected me at times in love. Some have tried to encourage me to take care of myself. I have to live as much as my strength will allow. I've hit my walls often and my body stops and my mind often. I've been frustrated, I've been in pain, I've struggled. But in all, I have grown in my Father's strength and stood in His promises more and more. 
I've never wavered in knowing God's power every day. I walk in His grace. I never ask why. God hasn't, uh, God hasn't done this to me. God is with me in it. We don't run from God. We run to Him. I pray that even in the raw moments, I have shown God's power. This Thanksgiving, I am so very thankful for life, for laughter, for family, for friends, for community, for my medical team, for my experiences each day. In a way, hearing cancer maybe helped me. I live, I laugh, I know joy, I walk in hope and promise. I can show those around me what it is to smile in God's power. I've claimed some truths along the way. Each important is in its own meaning. When I speak of death, some feel I'm giving in uh, on faith. No, by no means. If I die tomorrow, it changes nothing of the power and praise of God. My life, my sorrows, my healing, my woes changes nothing of the miraculous power of God. I'm not dying of cancer. I am living with cancer. I am not scared. I am blessed. And as always, be still and know. I don't read that as if it's equal to Scripture. I read that because that is a man whose testimony about what God has done in his life amidst this tremendous diagnosis. Yeah, it's tough. But how much through our pain, through our experiences, can we look up and say, you know what, God? To you be the glory. I didn't plan this to come out right before Thanksgiving again. We just work through the scripture as God reveals it. But this Thursday, when we're sitting around our tables and we're with our family, let's be thankful. Let's be thankful that God has blessed us. Let's be thankful that we live in a land with all the sacrifice that, we, that has been given, with all the stuff that we're going on right now, that we live in a land that we love God, that we have this opportunity to come before him. As we stand together, let's think about verse 33. But seek thee first, the kingdom of God. Whatever happens to you. Man, if it's the greatest thing ever. Man, if, if tomorrow uh, you get a new job that pays you a gazillion dollars uh, a year and you do all this, man, to God be the glory. And if tomorrow the phone rings and the terrible news on the other side, to God be the glory. We want a true fix for anxiety. Man, I wish I could come up with it. But ultimately, it's we got to figure out how to live our life for the kingdom of God not for ourselves. Our closing song.